Cei dacă pun acum mâncare, Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. That sounds a lot better. All right, starting again. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, for those in Geneva who probably heard me a little bit better um, and remotely for um, those around the world, my name is Laura Caur Garcia. I'm the uh, project manager for protests, rights, and policing um, for the International Network of Civil Liberties Organizations, a network organization made up of 15 national human rights and civil liberties organizations. Alongside our partners, Physicians for Human Rights, Amnesty International, supporting members de Justicia, Cells, and Contras, we're looking forward to hosting this side event, Preventing the Health and Human Rights Harms of Crowd Control Weapons. We're very grateful to the UN Permanent Mission of Argentina for co-sponsoring this event. Argentina has been a crucial partner and time and time again displays their long-standing commitment to the issues that bring us together today. In 2017, they were founders and co-chairs of the Alliance for a Torture-Free Trade Treaty alongside the EU and Mongolia. In 2019, they steered the successful 2019 resolution through UNGA the established and that established the Group for Government Experts. We're honored and delighted to be joined by His Excellency Ambassador Federico Vichegas of the UN Permanent Mission for Argentina, who will open our side event. Um, His Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Um, uh, I think that this is a, a very important discussion and it's a timely event um, because the evidence is there and the evidence there's a global health and human rights harms caused by crowd control weapons. Um, and the, as you know, the acronym is CCWs. Uh, but I have to tell that uh, here in Geneva, we also have the CCW without the S, that uh, I happens to be the chair of the CCW, which is the 
Convention on Conventional Weapons, the Conference on Conventional Weapons. Um, so the evidence is there. We need to do something, and I, I think it's very important. So we would like to just, uh, I would like to just say why Argentina uh, is co-sponsoring this event and why we think this discussion is important. First of all, the historical perspective on two things have to be, has to be remembered. First, uh, the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights should guide us every single day, every single minute this year. In one important sense, that uh, social contract, that milestone, has only 75 years. In historical terms, uh, in the, this whole idea, this revolutionary idea of international law of human rights is very, very new. What we are doing is actually the tip of the iceberg of the progressive development of human rights. And this is obvious just looking around the world, the challenges on human rights we have on so many issues. So uh, that means that any discussion to make that iceberg emerge uh, is important. But this particular discussion has another additional uh, perspective. Uh, one of the most important social contracts and evolutions that humanity was able to make was the prohibition of torture. We have to remember always that torture, the same way that, as slavery or colonialism, were accepted and justified, justified by the most developed nations of the world from the juridical, even from the moral, point of view. And we said, never again. We decided as humanity at large, never again. So mm -hmm. this discussion is not only linked to a present situation of the evidence of the harm of these type of weapons in, in dealing with the peaceful assembly. It, it, in the heart has the prohibition of torture and the prevention of torture. So that combination should guide us in every, anything we do on this issue from now on. And of course, the last comment, it's not easy when you have to balance two rights that sometimes in practical terms for a government or for a state that is responsible to guarantee the respect of all the rights it's, it is difficult, and we have to be honest. It, it's something that we need to discuss openly and give the states the possibilities to exercise the role of respecting human rights or making people respect human rights uh, without infringing international obligations. So hopefully uh, events like this will build the case for that iceberg to emerge. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Vichegas. Uh, we appreciate so much you opening our events, reminding us of the guiding principles that should lead um, these discussions and this work, um, and especially taking the time um, when you know you have perhaps another event uh, soon. Sharing this afterwards, so just something to bear in mind um, if you wish to not have your name uh, publicly there. We remind you there are rules regarding uh, taking photographs. We already have notably the 2020 UN Human Rights Guidance on Less Lethal Weapons in Law Enforcement, we are seeing a pervasive and escalating number of injuries and deaths due to crowd control weapons. And these fast emerging technologies propose a significant challenge to its regulation. Our panelists here are from around the world and they'll highlight uh, cases of misuse of crowd control weapons by law enforcement, share some of the recommendations to limit these human rights violations and make efforts for accountability and redress to be more effective. We will also hear about the momentum that is building around a torture-free trade treaty, which signals a shift towards a more humane and ethical international trade landscape. Now, without further ado, it's my pleasure and profound honor to introduce our keynote speaker, UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Peaceful Assembly and of Association, Mr. Clément Voul. Monsieur Voul uh, took up the role of UN Special Rapporteur in April 2018, 
Prior to his appointment, he led the International Service for Human Rights and coordinated the organization's work in Africa as the advocacy director. He's also worked as Secretary General of the Togolese Coalition of Human Rights Defenders as a campaigner for the Togolese Coalition for the International Criminal Court. Mr. Vool has been a leading voice for the defense and protection of all voices who seek to express their opinion and dissent. And we're immensely grateful that he would take the time from his busy agenda to join our event. Um, thank you again, Mr. Vool, and the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, um, Excellencies. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, let me first thank Physician for Human Rights, uh, the International Network of Civil Liberties Organization, Amnesty International, for inviting me for this important discussion, which is in line with um, the ongoing and increasing uh, challenges that uh, least little weapon or crowd control weapon pose when it comes to the peaceful assembly. Um, least little weapon when used in accordance with the international law and standard for the use of force, have an important role in the law enforcement policy in assembly. Their purpose is to protect individuals while facilitating the right to freedom of peaceful assembly and to uphold the law and public order. Least lethal weapon may be used when some degree of force is absolutely necessary to prevent or to reduce the risk of injury to members of the public. To avoid the need to resort to, least, to lethal force, it is important that law enforcement officials are equipped with an appropriate range of least lethal weapons and related equipment, and that these are used when other non lethal means fail. In graduate term, with the view to prevent and avoid harm. As the Human Rights Committee has indicated in its general commentary six, on the right to life, least lethal weapon must be employed only when they are subjected to strict requirements of necessity and proportionality in situations in which other least harmful measures have proven to be or are clearly ineffective to address the threat, the threat. However, through my mandate, I have observed and sounded the alarm of many situations when less lethal weapons for crowd control, such as tear gas, canisters, rubber bullets, flash burn, grenades, had a harmful impact. There is an increased threat of such weapons being used unnecessarily and disproportionately in the context of assemblies. Often, such weapons are used as a first resort rather than as a last resort, violating the principle of necessity and proportionality. And often these have been used indiscriminately or have been deliberately used or misused to harm or punish those exercising their right to freedom of peaceful assembly and of association. For example, I have recorded the indiscriminate and disproportionate use of tear gas and water cannon by law enforcement aim at dispersing peaceful assembly, inflicting serious harm to protesters, journalists, medic, and bystander. For example, in 2017, I expressed my concern regarding allegation that Bahrain authorities had used tear gas and firearm, including shotguns equipped with Best shots and lethal anti-personnel weapon. In 2019, I expressed concern about the excessive use of force in Chile against demonstrators, including children and adolescents, which injured at least 1,574 people. Several sources indicate that the authority resorted to extensive use of tear gas, pellets, and rubber bullets. Also in 2019, I expressed my concern about the Hong Kong police force alleged use of, extens of excessive force to violently disperse protesters. Some unarmed demonstrators were targeted and hit at their head with rubber bullets. The police force also used 
pepper sprayed against other peaceful demonstrators who posing no threats on multiple time at a very close range. Police also fired tear gas, pepper spread, tear spread, and rubber bullets at protesters repeatedly without any prior warning. It is estimated that at least 72 protesters were injured during the operation, according to the Hong Kong hospital authorities. In August last year, I expressed my deep concern about allegations of continuous used by Sudanese security forces of live ammunition, stun grenades, water cannon, and indiscriminately and excessively firing tear gas at peaceful protest sites, resulting in death and serious injury of protesters and bystanders, including women and children. These weapons have been often used in residence area, impacting communities, and also in closed places, including in hospitals, to prevent the access to help and punish injured protesters. For example, according to medical sources, in the context of the peaceful pro protest on 30 June 2022 in Khartoum, Sudan security forces attempted to raid hospital, which were threats, which were, which were threatening injured protesters and alleged fire tear gas into at least one hospital. Such unlawful use of this weapon and the harm it inflicts may constitute torture and ill treatment, as well as extrajudicial killing that are constituting serious violation of international laws. The harm of the misuse of this weapon have been serious. Hundreds of protesters and many journalists reporting on protests have been seriously injured, including losing eyesight or eyes, or have been disabled or killed as a result. Victim of abuses as a, as a result of this use of less lethal weapon in the context of assembly also suffer long-term psychological trauma. The damage impact of such weapon on children is even higher due to their vulnerability. In my 2022 report dedicated to the protecting human rights in the context of peaceful protests in the crisis situation, I have raised particular concern of the misuse of less lethal weapon by law enforcement in the context of protests. In this report, I call on states to ensure such weapons are used in accordance with the international human rights standard related to the use of force and that law enforcement are adequately trained in the use of such weapon in compliance with human rights. I stress that particular tear gas and water cannon, given their inherent indiscriminate nature, may only be used when there is a widespread violence in the context of assembly. In the mentioned report on protests in crisis, I also mentioned that to guarantee the protection of human rights of those exercising their freedom, I call on the state to adopt protocol on the facilitation of peaceful protests for law enforcement compatible with international standards regarding the use of force, including setting clear limitations on the use of least lethal weapon. I also urge states to conduct regular training to limit the use of least lethal weapon in, in order to mitigate the potential harm of their use in the context of assembly and to regularly review the equipment and weapon provided to law enforcement personnel involving in facilitating protest. Furthermore, I call on the third part states and companies to refrain from transferring or selling least lethal equipment to states where such equipment has been used to repress protests or to commit human rights violations in the context of assemblies. I would like to refer to the OSHR guidance on least lethal weapon in law enforcement. This guidance aims at assisting states and their law enforcement agency in fulfilling their duty to put procedure in place in order to ensure less lethal weapons are used in accordance with international human rights law and standards. However, 
The increased misuse of least lethal weapons shows that states have to step, step up their effort to implement them. The guidance also states that states shall regular, regulate all transfers, including exports and imports of least lethal weapon and related equipment in accordance with the international obligation. The rapid proliferation of such weapon and the harm they have been inflicting during assembly shows the need for strengthening international regulation and oversight mechanism, including related to the manufacture, transfer, and the use of such weapon. To strengthen the protection of human rights in the context of peaceful protests, I support efforts seeking to strengthen the regulation of crowd control weapon, including through the adoption of an international binding normative framework imposing ban on certain least lethal weapons which have or can inflict serious harm if not appropriately used. Further, there, there should be an international binding agreement that prohibits the sale of weapons to countries which documented human rights violation, in particular in the context of assemblies. The lack of, the lack of clear regulatory framework over the use and transfer of less lethal weapons impact the accountability for human rights abuses caused by such weapons. One of the recommendations of my upcoming report to the HRC 53, which will happen in, in, two, in two days, considering the accountability gap for such violation, including ensuring robust and transparent reporting procedure and monitoring of the use of such weapon, my report emphasized on the international community to really take stand to regulate this area. This is vital to establish responsibility including commander responsibility and to ensure those responsible are held accountable. In addition to judicial prose prosecution and administrative sanction of perpetrator, full reparation should be provided to repair the harm to the victim and ensure non-repetition, taking in a, into account the harm cause and specific need of a victim. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Rule. Wonderful. So um, earlier this year, Physicians for Human Rights and INCLO, in collaboration with Omega Research Foundation, published Lethal in Disguise 2, How Crowd Control Weapons Impact Health and Human Rights, the most comprehensive study on crowd control weapons to date. Um, which was an update and an expansion to a first Lethal in Disguise report published in 2016. Why did we believe there was a crucial need for this updated data? Part of the reason is um, you can hear in the examples that the UN Special Rapporteur just mentioned. Um, from Washington to Santiago, Belarus to Hong Kong, protest movements have become increasingly common and multitudinous as well the violent crackdowns by government and security forces. Since we published Lethal in Disguise 1, the nature, scale, and documentation of protests and the weapons used have evolved considerably. Over the past eight years, crowd control weapons manufacturing, marketing, and use have proliferated, resulting in more injuries and less accountability for their harms. Now, all is not negative since we published the first report. There has been progress in international standards and awareness, especially about the lethality of these weapons. Um, however, there is much more to be done. In many countries, there is a lack of documentation, a lack of reporting and investigation of injuries. Meaningful accountability for crowd control weapons abuses remains rare. The report is unique in that it combines medical and human rights technical expertise in their um, know-how. Um, we documented that more than 119,000 people have been injured by tear gas and other chemical irritants during protests around the world since 2015, while at least 2,190 people have been injured by rubber bullets and other types of kinetic impact projectiles. 
as if these numbers are not alarming enough. We know these statistics are bare minimum estimates as many times the use of crowd control weapons and resulting harms go underreported. And every day we're adding case studies. It's hard to keep up with those. You will hear more details on cases from Colombia and Indonesia next and what organizations on the ground recommend. I encourage you to find our full report in lethalindisguise.org, where you find additional case studies, a full medical review of each of these weapons, an overview of international legal standards and recommendations. The key recommendations I would like to highlight in closing are rubber bullets, kinetic impact projectiles should be banned in all crowd control settings, especially multiple um, multi-projectile kinetic impact projectiles, which are inherently indiscriminate and projectiles with metal components. There should be tighter restrictions on weapons that may be used indiscriminately and harm peaceful civilians without cause, such as uh, tear gas, acoustic weapons, water cannons, as mentioned right before, um, batons and others. A prohibition of weapons that result in collective punishment, like putting dyes or maladorans in water cannons, a prohibition of weapons that cause excessive harm in protest settings, including electric conduction weapons, stun grenades, and bird shot pellets. And then finally, regulation of crowd control weapons design, manufacture, and tra trade and use as is being defined in the really important work that's being done by the Alliance for Torture-Free Trade Treaty. So with that, I want to close my uh, remarks and wanted to turn to uh, Sofia Poredo Alba, who I have right next to me. Sofia is a researcher for the Justicia, a Colombia-based research and advocacy organization dedicated to the strengthening of the rule of law and the promotion of social justice and human rights in Colombia and the Global South. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, between 2019 and 2021, large social mobilizations took place in Colombia. Also, protests uh, took place throughout the country. The largest number were concentrated in Cali, the second city in Latin America with the highest population uh, of Af Afro-descendant people, who represent 52% of the city's total population. While the police response to the protest was excessive and disproportionate, nationwide, Cali was the epicenter of the worst violence committed by the police against demonstrators. There were more than 82 Afro-descendant victims between the ages of 13 and 60, including murder, forced disappearances, illegal detentions, and gender violence. Social protests in Colombia continued to be perceived as a threat to public order, and this revealed the persistence of practices of repression, violence, and abuse of force and weapons. The most affected were young people from low-income sectors. Furthermore, discriminatory and racist tendencies were observed in the use of force, focusing repressive responses on indigenous and Afro-descendant populations. The situation of police violence is part of a historical problem of structural racism characterized by discriminatory treatment, verbal as, and symbolic violence, violation of the right to personal integrity and freedom, criminalization, profiling, and excessive use of force and weapons. Regarding co crowd control weapons, the misuse is different um, in different circumstances that generated serious harm to people's health. Tear gas grenades were used in closed spaces. Both tear gas grenades and kinetic impact projectiles of different types were fired at close range and against sensitive parts of the body of demonstrators and also bystanders. <coughs> this resulted in 116 eye injuries between April and December 2021, according to a report shots on site by organizations Temblores País and Amnesty International. These injuries have caused total or partial blindness. In other cases, there have been deaths of people hit with this type of weapons, like the case of Dylan Cruz 
in November 2019 after being hit by a bing bag projectile. Also, new weapons were used in 2021, such as the Venom Launcher, which presents very high risks of indiscriminate damage, especially when used inappropriately. Both cases are included and analyzed in detail in the report Lethal in Disguise 2. Now, the arrival of President Gustavo Petro last year meant a change in the discourse about the responsibility of of police officers in human rights violations in context of protest. He has recognized the importance of police reform in several areas, although no structural changes have been implemented in terms of police reform so far. The national government has listened to proposals of civil society organizations. Uh, in fact, the Minister of Defense has invited us to participate in the review of the guides related to the use of crowd control weapons. We hope that this will be a true space for dialogue and discussion that will allow for structural reforms on these issues. And we also insist that this whole process of police reform must consider the active participation of victims, survivors, and civil society organizations in order to advance in the respect and guarantee of the rights that have been repeatedly violated in the context of social protest. Thank you so much, Sophia. Um, it's really wonderful to kind of hear the, the recent developments there um, and, and the remarks um, from the work of the Justicia. Just a quick note before I turn to the next speaker, um, that UN Special Rapporteur Vool has a, um, another engagement soon, so he will have to be heading out a little bit earlier, but we're so thankful for um, you taking the time um, and opening our event. Thank you very much. Um, turning uh, to the next speaker to our panel, um, I would like to introduce Nadine Sharani Salsavila, who is part of the international advocacy team of the Commission for the Disappeared and Victims of Violence, also known as CONTRAS. CONTRAS is a national human rights non-governmental organization based in Jakarta, Indonesia, and has its main activities are geared towards the support for the victims of human rights violations. Nadine, the floor is yours. Okay, um, I hope my voice is clear enough for everyone to hear. Um, hi, good afternoon. Salam from Indonesia. So in terms of the challenges to ensure accountability for the Indonesian human rights, especially when it comes to torture events, which we are currently commemorating in this horrible day on the 26th of June, Basically, Indonesia has its very own legal basis, which are stated in two laws, law number 26 of tw uh, 2000 and law number 39 of 1099. Um, and in, law, uh, in both laws, it has highlighted the rights of the civilians to be protected by the government and to fulfill their human rights and its accountability. Another law that I could mention in this um, in this meeting is that in terms of torture itself specifically, Indonesia has also ratified the UN Convention Against Torture um, through law number five of um, 1998, and where this is kept as a proof that Indonesia is willing uh, and in compliance to decrease the number of torture and its impact long-term or short-term to its victims and the civilians. And this can be also be highlighted in one of the laws, um, which is the law on Indonesian police chief number one of 2009 to underline the proportional role of police to ensure the security for its civilians. But by mentioning these four laws um, in this very meeting, instead the state as well as the Indonesian National Police is alleged in tolerating torture and the use of weapons in terms of crowd control weapons from the security officers to the civilians. And we received a report and also monitor that more than not only 50 victims, but 50 events of torture of crowd control weapon happen in Indonesia within May 2022 until June 2023, up until this moment. 
And we can see that the main victims of these cases revolving around students, activists who were experiencing beatings from the police when expressing their opinion, their concern in Indonesia through protests. Um, and also there has been a lot of numbers of false accusations being led to civilians and leading to torture events when there comes an investigation from the police and even the high number of torture against children. We can see that the icing or the cherry on top of this very horrific events in Indonesia can be based from the Kanjuruhan tragedy in Malang, is Java, Indonesia. As mentioned maybe in our report or publication, The Lethal in Disguise 2, is the cherry on top of how can we see the misuse of power and authority by the security officers in Indonesia as a whole by allowing weapons to be exercised and used to civilians. The tragedy has not only caused 135 death toll, but also more than 600, 600 underlined, to be severely injured, blind, and many more. Um, two of our prominent organization institution in Indonesia, the NHRI, and also the Ministry for Political, Legal, Security Affairs of Indonesia have stated that this very tragedy is not considered as a gross human rights violation, sadly. So our organization, the Commission for the Disappeared and Victims of Violence, Contrast Indonesia, went ahead in doing independent investigation directly to the victims of the violence in the tragedy or the family of victims who have been left by the victims themselves. By monitoring before and even after the trial of the case, where the perpetrators were only jailed for only six months. And we also seek national and also international support and also advocacy to ensure, to make sure that justice is well received by the victims and family victims who have been left by the victims themselves, to be more aware that torture, especially crowd control weapons, is still exercised by our security officers in Indonesia and is still happening by two of those powers who have the authority to do so. We recommend that the state who are closely related to the mentioned case to stop using crowd control weapons, seeing the short and long-term impact and even leading to death to its victims. And to stress out the point from the Indonesian government for the police reform and also for the justice well received to the victims and family of the victims. We also see, uh, not only from contrast, but also from the CSOs of Indonesia and also regional CSOs who have been monitoring this case and how the trial went on, that the UN and its members have its utmost power to monitor and also to give strong commitment and strong statements to the Indonesian governments and actors involved to stop tolerating torture and to stop um, using crowd control weapon throughout its ensuring safety quote and quote and activities. The CSOs of Indonesia um, wishes to decrease the number of torture in Indonesia, especially by hampering the mentioned actors to use weapons covered by the safe word, again, ensuring the safety of the civilians. So that is all from my side. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Nadine. Um, and because I know we're a little bit tight on time, I'll quickly move on to our last, but certainly not least, panelist. Um, I want to introduce Verity Coyle, who is Senior Campaigner and Advisor on Military Security and Policing at the International Secretariat of Amnesty International. Um, Verity? Thank you, Laura. And in light of what we've just heard, it is shocking to us that there are currently no human rights controls at the global level on the trade in goods used to torture or ill-treat people. While the focus of torture prevention has traditionally been on custodial settings, such as police cells and prisons, once people have been deprived of their liberty, 
There's been an evolution in international understandings, placing more emphasis on extra custodial settings. So we're talking about torture and other ill treatment during protest, but not only during protest, in the process of arrest or during a forced eviction. The push for a torture-free trade treaty reflects this understanding, the desire to prevent law enforcement equipment being used to inflict torture or other ill treatment in both custodial and extra-custodial settings. You could argue that the obligation to prohibit and prevent torture means states should already be taking action in this area, but there's no international body or mechanism that is clarifying this obligation and explicitly saying what is required of states in this area. So a torture-free trade treaty would fill a gap in the existing legal architecture. It would reinforce existing obligations while clarifying an important and technical area of torture prevention. In a similar way that there are regulations and controls put in place for the transfer and trade of military equipment used by the police and security forces. So a torture-free trade treaty would strengthen existing laws and efforts to prevent torture by closing a clear loophole in state practice, which can lead to the facilitation of torture or other ill treatment. It would make explicit states' extraterritorial obligations related to the trade in police and security equipment, and it would highlight the non-custodial incidents of torture and cruel, inhumane, degrading treatment and its intersection with the right to freedom of peaceful assembly. We and partners have published a position paper, The Essential Elements of a Torture-Free Trade Treaty, which you can find on our website. It is worth noting that many states are very familiar with the concept of human rights-based trade controls and assessing for risks in export control processes based on their experience of implementing the 2013 Arms Trade Treaty, which 113 states are now party to. During the last 10 years, the Human Rights Council has worked on the topic of freedom of peaceful assembly and issued recommendations on the need to establish controls around the production and use of less lethal weapons. Relatedly, the resolution 3811 from 2018 encourages states to make appropriate protective equipment and less lethal weapons available to their officials exercising law enforcement duties in order to decrease their need to use weapons of any kind while pursuing efforts to regulate and establish protocols for the training and use of less lethal weapons, bearing in mind that even less lethal weapons could result in a risk to life. The work of the Human Rights Council was accompanied by reports and analysis by the Special Rapporteur on Peaceful Assembly and Association and the Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Summary or Arbitrary Executions, who also recommended to strengthen the regulation of these weapons. In September 2017, Argentina, the EU and Mongolia launched the Alliance for Torture-Free Trade at the UN General Assembly's margins in New York. The Alliance currently comprises of over 60 states from all regions of the world, acting to, pledging to act together to further prevent, restrict and end trade in goods used for torture and other ill treatment. On the 28th of June 2019, the General Assembly adopted a resolution towards torture-free trade, initiating a process for examining the feasibility scope and parameters in this area. The first stage in the UN process resulted in the um, Secretary General's study of member states' positions, which found that the majority of respondent states supported international standards, with most believing they should be legally binding. The second stage consisted of the establishment of a group of governmental experts to explore the feasibility scope and parameters of international standards. That report was published in May 2022. One of the options the group of governmental experts reports highlights is the negotiation of a legally binding instrument. And should this option proceed, the report recommends an intergovernmental working group process to increase participation of states, including the formation of an expert working group. Amnesty and our partner organisations believe that this international trade can most effectively be addressed by an international legally binding instrument. Only this approach can build a common architecture for compliance at international and state level, 
incorporating standardised national control regimes, information sharing and trade monitoring mechanisms. It was very heartening to hear the Special Rapporteur's comments at the top of this panel. Thank you, Laura. Thank you so much, Verity. And I think it was wonderful as and you already began to answer some of my um, my next question that I had for you. So considering the, the time that we have left, I want to turn two quick questions first to Sophia and Nadine. And if we have time to Verity. Um, also, um, we, we want um, to open the, the um, floor if there's anyone in the audience that would ask. So um, begin to think of those um, questions if you'd like. Um, so just to start with uh, Sophia, um, you start to delineate some of the, the human rights harms, but I wanted to kind of ask you um, regarding what the long-term consequences you see um, for human rights when police use and misuse crowd control weapons um, regularly. Uh, well, crowd control weapons have serious risks uh, even when they are used following the instructions and protocols indicated by their appropriate use. Although they are named less lethal weapons because their effects are considered less serious or do not represent a risk to people's lives, their misuse can cause serious harm and even death. In this sense, I think that the use of these weapons represents a risk to their right to life and the right to integrity because people can face serious damage to their health, including mental and emotional health. Uh, they can be victims of torture and cruel treatment, also face a um, disability, and in some cases can lead to death. There is also an impact on the right to free expression and the right to protest when these weapons are used to punish protesters, uh, causing a chilling effect because people avoid uh, going out to express their grievances for fear of being injured, tortured, or even killed. Um, there is a violation of the right to equality and non-discrimination also, since the use of these weapons has differentiated effects and impacts on certain groups, such as women and LGBTIQ plus people who are victims of other violence and harm because of their gender or sexual orientation, or Afro-descendants and indigenous people who face additional violence due to structural racism. Thank you, Sophia. Um, and before, I mean, I have a couple questions prepared, but I wanted to prioritize those on the floor. And so I wanted to ask if there was anyone in the audience that would have a question, yes? Thank you. My question would have been about the long-term effects of the inappropriate use of crowd control weapons, but since she has already uh, answered that, I would like to make a comment here. While I was looking at the, these, uh, this brochure, I have seen some pa uh, victims of the tear gas, but unfortunately there is no picture of pallet gun victims, because we know that some states are using pallet guns to control protesters as well. I would like to mention Insha Mushtaq, who was blinded by the lead pallets in 2016 when she was only six, 14 years old. The incident was also reported by Amnesty International under the title, Losing Sight in Kashmir. She lost her vision, but did not lost hope. And recently she has cleared her 12th grade exam and aspires to be an engineer. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Very important uh, to mention the pellets. Um, and we have some of those ca cases of multiple pellets being used um, in Kashmir and other countries in the report. So thank you so much for bringing that up. Any other questions um, from the audience members? If not, um, Nadine, uh, for you. Um, you started beginning uh, to talk a little bit about Contra's work and the importance of ensuring truth and transparency um, when there are these uh, human rights violations. And I wanted to ask um, what you think or what your recommendations are um, to ensure that we can secure accountability for victims of crowd control weapons. Tough question. Um, of course, when it comes to ensuring the accountability for the victims itself is a very big homework, not only for contrast, but also a lot of organizations who are working to advocate um, throughout 
those um, involving around torture issues to the civilians. But maybe one of the practices that can be um, copy and paste through contrast is that contrast is also actually a part of the group which contains a coalition of civil society um, including all of the families of the victims of the Kanjuruhan tragedy, if we can take that tragedy as one of the um, main example. And um, throughout this group, we are active in communicating, not only updating the development of the case, um, development of the impact, because we know that from time to time, there will be more stories to untold. Um, but we also try to then um, communicate with the family of victims, what are the current next steps for it to make it happen. And in terms of the coalition itself and the case assistance, we also have um, a large communication phase with still with the NHRI, even though they have claimed that the Kanjuruhan tragedy does not and is not considered as a gross human rights violation. Um, in this case, um, we also have um, been visiting a lot of organizations revolving around um, in this coalition, for example, the Witness and Victim Protection Agency, um, and then also the Legal Aid Foundation in Malang, uh, where the Kanjuruhan tragedy is based, um, a lot of gender groups and many more, including um, the family victims. But we really want to make sure that the main priority is to always upscale and to always update this to the local and also national media. Because we know that the stance of the government, the stance of the security officer is not well through for this case. So maybe what we can conclude as the first baby step to make justice happen and be prevailed is to gain tons of exposures locally and also internationally. Because we also realize that a lot of international medias are currently going on and on and asking about this case. So those are several small but impactful steps that we can do to hold accountable. Wonderful, thank you, Nadine. Um, once more, I wanted to turn to the floor in case there was any questions from the audience. We still have time for maybe one more question. No worries, we were very complete in our uh, presentations. I think then, because we have a couple more minutes, um, Verity, I wanted to turn to you. You already uh, laid out quite in detail sort of what the timeline has been and the work that's been uh, going um, regarding the Torture Free Trade Treaty. Um, but I wanted to ask you what individual member states can do now to finalize, adopt, and implement. Thanks, Laura. Well, there's still a way to go. And I would say a first step for interested states, if they haven't already, is to join the Alliance for Torture Free Trade. And for those states who have already joined that group to be active within it, to push for high standards and to push for an ambitious path forward. When any international agreement is negotiated, it would first require a resolution calling for a mandate we would see this happening at the General Assembly, given the history of where the resolutions on this topic have happened already. So as civil society, we are becoming clearer and clearer in the Torture Free Trade Network of what we would like that treaty to look like, what we would like it to include. We're now a network of over 50 organizations working globally together to secure a torture-free trade treaty, and we stand ready to assist all states with an interest in this area as we move forward. It will require leadership from them, and we hope to see that from Argentina, the EU, and Mongolia, as we have in getting us this far in the process already. Thank you so much, Verity. And I think that's a, a wonderful way to kind of perhaps close that balance between knowing how global in nature this issue is. We've heard in time and time again, different examples across the world, but also um, how global our movement can be. Um, and I think there's momentum and incredible opportunity right now, and it is absolutely crucial. So I want to thank all of you who have joined us today. I want to thank all the speakers of the panel, and even though they're not here, um, His Excellency Ambassador from Argentina, Federico Vichegas, as well as you and Special Rapporteur Vuel, um, who made this event happen. So thank you so much to everyone here.
this for everybody? No, this is for yeah. Huh? Hello, ma'am. Good afternoon, everybody. So, dear colleagues, welcome to the side event, a discussion on the current challenges to the independence of judges and lawyers. This event is organized by the International Bar Association's Human Rights Institute, IBARI, and the um, International Commission of Jurists, the ICJ. Before I start, I just want to also to mention that the side event is co-sponsored by the Geneva Bar Association, the Law Society of England and Wales, Lawyers for Lawyers, Lawyers Rights Watch Canada, and the International Association of Democratic Lawyers. Please, um, uh, as you know, uh, it is forbidden to take pictures. There is just one person in the room who is allowed to take the pictures, so I kindly ask you not to take pictures. Um, so let's get started. Um, I have the honor to introduce here with me the UN Special Rapporteur on the Independence of Judges and Lawyers, um, Ms. Margaret Sutherwaite who will highlight our main uh, elements included in the first report, Reimagining Justice, Confronting Contemporary Challenges to the Independence of Judges and Lawyers, that was presented this morning at the 30, uh, 53rd session of the Human Rights Council. Meg, let me first, uh, and uh, from the outset, congratulate on your first report. It is a vision-setting and forward-looking document. It touches upon a number of challenges and compelling issues on both judicial independence and the protection of lawyers, uh, such as the autocratization and democratic decay, the disinformation slap, and the use of artificial intelligence in the decision making, but also the need to strengthen the role of prosecutors and the uh, legal empowerment, especially community based legal empowerment. Now, without further ado, uh, Special Rapporteur, you have the floor. Thank you so much for um, that invitation, uh, sorry, for that introduction and for the invitation to be here today. Um, I want to thank the organizers and the sponsors for kindly arranging this event and, of course, all of you for attending. Um, when addressing the Human Rights Council this morning, I spoke about the vital part that independent judges and lawyers play in protecting human rights. They do so by upholding individual rights claims and also by participating as key actors in a legal system that functions to check the might of the state. Those of you in this room will already be acutely aware of the importance of the rule of law and of the need to protect the institutions, the individuals who safeguard this principle on a daily basis. And yet this is an age of rising author authoritarianism and democratic backsliding in which the rule of law is coming increasingly under threat. The World Justice Project reports that 2022 was the fifth year in a row that the rule of law declined in most countries, with checks on government power falling in 58% of countries, and respect for core human rights and freedoms falling in two-thirds of the countries. In large part, this is because powerful actors have a strong interest in capturing and weakening an independent legal system that would otherwise provide limits on their con 